Good evening, or morning, or afternoon, depending on when you're listening to this. Today, I'd like to talk about Gore Vidal's historical novel, Julian, which is a fictional account of the real-life Emperor Julian Augustus, from his childhood up until his death, told through the memoir he wrote, a personal diary which he kept, and an exchange of letters between two Roman philosophers called Priscus and Libanius, or Libanius, I'm going to say Libanius, because I don't know. And the reason I'd like to talk about this novel in particular, partly it's because I have been meaning to read some Gorvidal for a while and never got around to it. I picked this novel up at a market for, I believe, three or four euros. I saw it and immediately bought it. It's one of his more famous novels, for good reason. It's excellent. The main reason I wanted to talk about it was because on Gore Vidal's Wikipedia page, he's described as an epigrammatic wit. That is, he always had a a witty comment or an axiom to use for any occasion. For example, he had an ongoing feud with Norman Mailer, and they were at a party together, and... Mailer threw a drink at Vidal and punched him in the face, and Vidal fell to the ground. And while he was on the ground, (laughs) while he was on the ground, Vidal managed to say, as always, words fail, Norman Mailer, (laughs) which is, is quite a famous comeback and is rather fantastic, to be honest. That same wit comes through very obviously in In Julian, for example, very early on. In a letter exchange between Libanius and Priscus, Priscus has explained how he is still having sex despite his old age, and Libanius responds, Let me say right off how pleased I am to learn of your unflagging sexual vigour. <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny. The novel is very humorous throughout, um, but the parts which most stuck out for me were often just these little asides, or certain passages, often from the two philosophers, which just dealt with kind of the human condition and how and how humans are and the things they do and why they do the things they do and just really interesting and, again, sometimes funny insights into what humans are like. One of the first examples I highlighted in the novel is when Julian, in his memoir, is talking about his half-brother, Gallus, who is leaving the home where they've grown up. He writes, After Gallus left, I wept for the last time as a child, yet I hated him. They say that to know oneself is to know all there is that is human. But of course, no one can ever know himself. Nothing human is finally calculable. Even to ourselves, we are strange. And I just found that really, really fantastic uh, kind of an insight into how really we don't know ourselves and uh, thinking about what identity means to us and why we do the things we do and why we feel the way we feel is often alien even to ourselves. Speaking from experience, one often has uncont- completely uncontrollable emotions and you have no explanations for why you have them and you know that the reason is ridiculous and irrational. Nonetheless, you can't help but have them. found that quite insightful. Then later on, for example, in a passage which I still think is extremely relevant today, Libanius is writing in a footnote to Julian's memoir about the prison system he writes that this was that he began to become interested in prison reform after he himself got put in prison. And he writes, At least our rulers are now aware of the barbarous conditions in which prisoners are held. I had never realised how truly hopeless our prison system is until I myself was incarcerated. But improvements are hard to make. Despite all evidence to the contrary, I do not think human beings are innately cruel, but they fear change of any kind. Which in itself, I think, is a very interesting thing to talk about, especially in the context of 380s prisons in the Roman Empire. And I think, as I said, quite relevant today in in so far as our prison systems are still very horrible and need reforming, particularly in the United States. But also, I don't think the system itself works particularly well in any Western country. Um, apart from perhaps some of the Scandinavian countries which implement a system more of reform than of punishment. And now I am digressing, which is exactly what Libanius himself writes. Then he goes on to talk about how he believes he's digressing because of his age, and he is 
He's in a session at the assembly and he says that people stop listening to him and start coughing and getting distracted. And when he talks to people one on one, they do the same thing. They make up an excuse uh, uh, as to why they have to be somewhere else. And he says, why am I like this? He talks to a friend and his friend said, because, my old dear, you have become a bore. And he writes, have I aged so greatly? Have I lost my power to define and persuade? Am I too serious? And I found that also quite interesting. Him talking about how as you age, as you become older, you become a person who just, you talk too much and you can't hold people's attention. And it's a bit of a cliche, but I think everyone has probably had a similar experience with a grandparent who just goes on and on. My late grandfather was like that. Interesting stories, no doubt, and had some had interesting things to say and relevant things to say. But just, God, you could never get away from him. Then moving on to another side note, this time by Priscus on Julian's memoir. Priscus tries to discuss the matter of why Julian disliked Christianity, because Julian was renowned for believing in myths and being quite superstitious. He turned to the myths of Mithras, which was um, a secret cult in the Roman Empire at the time, Hellenistic, so believed in the old gods. That was Julian's point. He wanted to revive belief in the old gods because Christianity was slowly but surely taking over the Roman Empire at the time. And Priscus writes, I suspect the origin of Julian's disaffection is in his family. Constantius was a passionate Christian, that's Julian's cousin, um, and the current Augustus, absorbed by doctrinal disputes. With good reason Julian hated Constantius, therefore he hated Christianity. This puts the matter far too simply, yet I always tend to the obvious view of things, since it is usually the correct one. Though, of course, one can never get to the bottom of anything so mysterious as another man's character. Again, kind of parroting what Labanius has written as a footnote earlier on in the novel about how we can't even know ourselves, Priscus agrees that you can never know another person's character. You can never find out exactly why they are who they are, particularly because they themselves don't even know, as much as they try to work it out. On page 109, at least of the edition I've got, which is the Modern Library edition, published in New York, this one published in 1970. Libanius again is talking about how tyrants can come to rule and basically saying that being charismatic is the most important quality that a leader can have insofar as then the people will love that leader, not saying that it's the thing that makes you the best leader. And he writes, They are completely frivolous in public matters. If a cruel tyrant is witty, they will adore him. But if their ruler is a good man, slow of speech, they will despise him. And I find that that's also extremely topical today. Of course, was in the early 60s as well when uh, Vidal was writing. But even today, we see populists who, who say the things that people want them to hear, like Nigel Farage, like Donald Trump. Although even politicians on the left who say things that the people on the left want to believe and they say that they will put these reforms through, which will make society fairer and more equal to everybody. and Without fail, we are disappointed. Uh, perhaps it's low-hanging fruit, perhaps it's a relatively obvious observation, but I found it one nonetheless worth pointing out. Then there's just one line that Julian himself writes in his memoir, where he writes about um, Eusebius, who was, an, who was an old teacher and kind of guardian of Julian, but whom he didn't get on with. And the Emperor Constantius has called Julian to Milan, where he's residing, and Julian thinks he might be getting put to death, and nobody really knows what's going to happen. He's just found out that he's not getting put to death. And Eusebius lies and pretends that the whole time he's backed Julian and he always wanted him to have a place at court and to remain alive, essentially. And they're exchanging these very, I mean, relatively passive-aggressive niceties with one another, couched in this extremely extravagant, polite language. And Julian just writes, the rhetoric of hate is often most effective when couched in the idiom of love. And I just think that's so perfect, so true. I just think of passive-aggressive arguments between people where, where they say almost exactly the opposite of what they mean, and really what they mean is, I hate everything about you. <laughs> but they're saying things which are polite and nice and asking about days. Also a relatively banal point, perhaps, but I think Vidal does it very, very well. Reminds me of a scene in The Office. It's after David Brent's been fired and he is spending all of his time at the office. And Gareth, who's taken his job, comes in and they have a very, very 
funny, passive-aggressive conversation where Gareth is saying to him that he should have called ahead and Gareth and David Brent saying, I, I, I don't need to call ahead, I'm not going to call ahead. If you haven't seen The Office and you don't know this thing I'm talking about, you better go look it up, hadn't you? Then later on, Priscus is talking about Macrina, a woman that Julian met while he was studying in Athens for a short time. I think he says he's there 47 days. And he meets, Priscus meets her later on in life when she's become old and bad looking. And she's talking to him about how she should love to be a whore. That's a quote. And describing to Priscus her sexual exploits. And Priscus says, I managed to interject before she gave too many specific details of her appetite. It is curious how little interested we are in the sexual desires of those who do not attract us. Pretty self-explanatory, but very true. It's telling how interested we are in the sexual habits of people that we do find good-looking, that we would also ourselves like to have sex with, and the people who we find repulsive, as Priscus finds Macrina repulsive, we, it's the last thing we want to hear about. Or maybe I'm just a prude. Then there's a part which I found quite funny because Julian is in Aloysius and he's talking about how you can't go to this sacred site that he's trying to visit without being accosted by traders hawking their goods. He writes, It's a wonder that any place remains sacred, considering the inevitable presence of those whose livelihoods depend on cheating strangers. And I found this really interesting. I wonder how much Gore Vidal was projecting his own experiences in the 1960s on Julian at that time, because it's also a bit of a cliche now that we go to places like Athens or Barcelona or even here in Berlin, and there's always people accosting you, wanting you to do touristy things and go and see the sights and sell you their wares. So I wonder really how... how accurate that is what Gore Vidal writes and he gives a partial bibliography at the back the first work in it is from Julian himself and it's entitled the works of the emperor and though those were his memoirs and the other things which he wrote which weren't few because he wanted to be a philosopher before, before he became the emperor and so I wonder if Julian himself did actually I haven't read Julian's memoir but I wonder if Julian himself did actually write something like that about how these places are no longer sacred because of the people who want to cheat strangers about how these these holy places have become tourist traps quite interesting i thought then there's a part later on when constantius is telling julian that he's going to become caesar and julian is trying to read constantius and he can't and he's talking about whether constantius himself is evil, the embodiment of evil, whether evil exists, or whether he is more complex. And Julian falls on the side that he's more complex. He writes, just in a single line, like the rest of us, Constantius was many men in the body of one. And this is a perfect example of what I mean in this novel, that there are just so many, also passages, but often just single lines thrown in. It was actually very annoying going back and trying to find all of the ones I wanted to talk about. Luckily, as I got about halfway through, I started to mark them and fold pages and stuff. Sorry for people who don't like their pages folders, but I bought the book, so sod off. And I found this just really interesting. Again, this idea of complexity within the human condition and how we have what we think are these fixed identities. And these identities actually are anything other than fixed. We are many different people depending on our mood, where we are, who we're with, even the weather. I think it's something that when you think about it, it's maybe banal, but when you see it in writing, you think, wow, that's so obvious and quite profound, I think. I, I, I think that the idea of a fixed identity, the I, is quite a Western idea, actually, and that probably you could find instances in other societies and in other philosophies where that doesn't really exist, where ideas of consciousness exist, of course, but where this idea of me doesn't really exist and in reality we are all kind and mean and spiteful and friendly and selfish and generous. Then there's a very nice note from Priscus a little later on as Julian is, I wouldn't say plotting, but on his way to overthrow Constantius and he writes to Constantius's credit and then he breaks himself off and he writes, why is one always trying to find good things to say about the bad? Is it our uneasy knowledge that their version of us would be precisely the same as ours of them, from another viewpoint and a conflicting interest? I love, I just really, really loved these 
little asides in this novel that just every time I found one, I just had to stop for a minute and have a little think about it and think, wow, that's really insightful. And they were weaved into the novel very, very seamlessly. Very, very seamlessly. Doesn't make any sense. Just seamlessly. And I found that really, really nice. And every time they were written in, they fit the voice that was describing them, which admittedly is only three voices. But they always fit the character that was saying them. And there were contradictions between the philosophers and between Julian in what they said and how they acted. But they all came to very, very similar conclusions as to what humans are like, who humans are, why people act the way they do, whether we can predict people's actions, whether you can really judge a person. Then there's a part, again from Priscus, where he is talking about a person called Sallust. And he says, he was most capable in every way an admirable man. Too admirable, perhaps. One often had the feeling that he was playing a part. He was invariably demure and diffident and modest and sensible. All those things the world believes it admires. Which is the point. Less self-conscious men invariably have traits we do not admire. The good and the bad are all mixed together. Sallust was all good. That must have taken intense self-discipline, as well as the awareness that he was indeed trying to be something he was not. And that's interesting, because Vidal, through the voice of Priscus, is writing that people can't be all good, that it's impossible to be virtuous, that all people are a mixture of good and bad traits, presumably to varying degrees, but in general we are all horrible and not horrible, which is a a theme in this novel which comes up quite a lot, I've noticed going through these notes. Then Gore Vidal perhaps as a defence to himself and to negative publicity which he received in the media. I don't know, I'm completely speculating. The only negative of Gore Vidal I know is the fantastic takedown which Christopher Hitchens wrote of him in Vanity Fair, and that was towards the end of Gore Vidal's life, and that was when he was already becoming basically a political nutjob who thought that 9-11 was an inside job and all of that stuff. So I don't know, I'm speculating. But Priscus writes, "'It is sad how tangled the relations among princes become.' He then breaks himself off mid-note and writes, What a ridiculous statement. We are all in the habit of censoring the great as if we were popular playwrights, when in fact ordinary folk are quite as devious and as willful and as desperate to survive, if not to prevail, as are the great, particularly philosophers. And Priscus, just as a side note, is he lives a relatively luxurious life. He goes around with prostitutes. He still drinks a lot. He has quite a bad relationship with his wife and that kind of spurs him on to be relatively hedonistic. I wonder if Priscus is the closest we get to Gore Vidal's actual personality shining through in this novel. At the same time, there's a more rational, calm philosopher, Libanius, who also writes side notes to the memoir. And I wonder if that's Gore Vidal trying to say to us, look, these are the two sides of me who are commenting on Julian Augustus's life. The one of them is relatively calm and together, and patient, and the other, that would be Libanius, and the other, Priscus, is hedonistic and impulsive and cynical and doesn't really have time for people and comes across essentially as a a grumpy old man, but quite a fun one, actually. He's the one I'd definitely the most like to go for a beer with. Anyway, an interesting thought, if that's how Gorvidal meant it. If it's not, maybe I should be an English teacher. For a second time, this idea comes up, yet through, this time through the voice of Julian, that you can never know another person. Just in a side note, he's talking about Helena, his wife, and her pleasure at Eusebia's dying. Eusebia is the then wife of the Emperor Constantius. And he writes, just as a side note, we never spoke of this matter again. That is, we never spoke of Helena's pleasure over this matter again, but I respected her passion, realising that one could never entirely know another human being, even though one has shed the same bed and the same life. Actually, interestingly, I've been watching Broadchurch recently, and this idea comes up quite a lot, that you can never know somebody else. I shan't ruin it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but the first series especially is very much revolves around the idea that you can, you can never really know people and that they can always do things which surprise you. I wonder why that keeps popping up into my... Should I take this as some kind of a sign? No, don't be ridiculous, there's no such thing as signs. Perhaps this is getting boring now, but the idea comes up again that we can all be tyrants. Priscus is speaking to Julian after he has observed a scene in which the eunuchs have essentially taken hostage 
a group of young men and boys and are committing sexual acts with them. He breaks up the party. And Priscus writes later on, I think what most distressed him, Julian, about the behaviour of the eunuchs was the knowledge that not only had he the power to do the same, but that he wanted to. This recognition of his own nature horrified him. Note that as he lingers over the scene, what most strikes him is not so much the demonstration of lust, but the power to do what one likes with another, and that other not a slave, but free. Our Julian, like all of us, had a touch of Tiberius in him, and he hated it. Priscus doesn't really seem to mind it that much that he has a touch of Tiberius in him, as he puts it. But Priscus is a bit of a hedonist and a bit cynical and I guess doesn't really think you can escape your own nature, which is interesting because he's the only one who is an atheist, a true atheist, or at least an agnostic. He says he doubts the existence of the gods. And the others all believe you can't escape your own fate and he believes you can't escape your own nature. And really, they're two sides of the same coin, at least from the perspective of the novel, a philosophical debate I will not go into right now. I'm not well qualified enough to have it. Then, later on, Priscus, again, he's talking about death. And he writes, Only last week I called Hippia, his wife, by my mother's name after half a century of marriage. I am, of course, losing my mind. He's very old at this point, by the way. But why not? When death comes, it will have nothing to take but a withered sack of bones. For the memory of Priscus, which is Priscus, will long since have flown. Are we just our memories? Is that all we are? Is that where our identity comes from? Or is there an innate identity within us? I tend to believe, although I think that we are different people on different days, that there is some kind of innate identity within us, controlled by our genes. How much our genes control our identity is a matter of debate. Of course, what happens to us, our environment, our culture, plays a huge role. And I believe mostly how we are defined is by how we act, not how we think. Because I believe that When we act, we know we are having an influence on the world around us. And when we think those thoughts can be very fleeting, they come in an instant and they are forgotten also in an instant often. Some stay with us, but most leave us. Actions, however, remain within us and become stronger memories, I believe, than thoughts that we have had. And therefore, if there is any kind of innate identity not controlled by genes, if we can say, I am this person, then it has to be defined on how we act, which then builds the memories we have, as opposed to what we think and how we feel. But that's just me. I'm no philosopher. Here's one very relevant to the current situation, the current coronavirus, COVID-19 pandemic. The Banius writes in a footnote to a part about famine, which is going on under Julius's rule. He is now Augustus. One curious aspect of human society is that preventative measures are seldom taken to avert disaster, even when the exact nature of the approaching calamity is perfectly plain. And then he talks about how the rains didn't fall in March and nobody did anything in May. People knew there was going to be shortage. Nobody did anything in June. There was famine. And that's when people started getting upset and started acting. There is a grim constant in this matter, which might be worth a philosopher's while to investigate. He concludes, rather relevant for today's situation, I think, as in our modern situation, the fact that preventative measures, of course, with regards to COVID, are now being taken, but weren't taken, particularly in the United Kingdom, when they should have been, when the rest of Europe was already locking down, knowing how bad this virus had become. I don't really want to spend much time musing over this. Then a part which is for me interesting as a historian. So uh, a Roman general has made a speech to the troops to try and rally them because they're fighting against the Persians and they all believe the Persians to be terrifying warriors. He holds up a dead Persian to them, which is a boy-like figure and says, this is what you're scared of, you need not be afraid. Julian then recounts that speech in his diary. Priscus has already recounted it in a side note earlier. He then writes another side note after Julian has recounted it. I hope that's clear. Traditionally, the reporting of speeches in historical texts is not meant to be literal, but my version of Valentinian's comments was accurate because I kept a few notes at the time, which I am now using in making this commentary. Yet here is Julian less than a week later already altering the text. History is idle gossip about a happening whose truth is lost the instant it has taken place. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. How history can never be an accurate representation of the events. How as soon as the history happens... The next interpretation of it is just that, an interpretation. Of course, some interpretations are better than others. Had Julian's recounting of the event been closer to what Valentinian had actually said as he was giving his rousing speech to the troops, then he would have given a better interpretation of that history. 
But even had he said it word for word correctly, he wouldn't have been able to do it with the same tone or in the same context. And therefore the history is in some small, perhaps minor, but nonetheless existent sense, flawed. Then Priscus writes relatively sentimentally, nostalgically, how Julian gives a letter back which he doesn't want to receive because it congratulates him on his victory in Persia, which he hasn't actually yet achieved. And Priscus recounts, I recall how the sun shone on the back of the hand and the blonde hairs glittered against sun-darkened skin. I also noticed what large nails he had now that he had ceased biting them. Curious the clarity with which one remembers the shape of a hand glimpsed years ago, while so many things of importance are lost. Merely a nice musing on how memory functions, and it's very true, I remember lots of trivial things in my past and there are important events I'm sure I've forgotten. Sometimes I'm re even reminded of these important events and I regret that I can't remember them myself with more clarity or any clarity at all sometimes. Then there's a very sad part, it's the last part which I've marked, where Priscus is recounting how one of his friends, Anatolius, was killed after being thrown from his horse and having his neck broken. And he says, I kept his drafts board, which I lost naturally. And he just writes, nothing. Those four words, and then just that final well afterwards, just really, really touched me how, in his old age, he's lost not only the people who meant something to him, but even the possessions he kept from them, the memorabilia, the tokens of friendship. He's lost those too, and he's lost essentially everything in his old age, even his health is failing him. Although, at least at the beginning of the letter exchange, which is now a, a year gone by from the beginning of the book, he is still able to have sex. So, you know, fair play, Priscus, mate. As I mentioned, that's my last note. I essentially wanted to record this because I really wanted to talk about Julian. I found it a really, really fantastic novel. That's not news, you know. The novel's half a century old, over half a century old. However, these little insights, I wanted to collate them somewhere. Thinking about these little asides and these little passages and, and saying something about them which may or may not be enlightening but is in the very least a little bit interesting is quite important, I think, because, because what's literature for if not to learn something about, if not yourself, then a time period or what it means to be human itself or something about truth. And I just think that Govardhan had so many beautiful little lines in this novel and they all come together and they say something about the human condition, which is essentially just that we are very complex beings. We are not fixed in one absolute identity, but we are many people within one person. And you cannot ever really know yourself as a person in the same way you can never really know somebody else. Not 100%. They're always going to do things which surprise you. And not just because they don't know themselves either, but because we are, as people are always changing. You see it throughout the memoirs of Julian in this novel. He changes from being a boy to just wanting to be a philosopher, from being Christian to being a Hellenist, not wanting to be Augustus to being this relatively bloodthirsty emperor that wants to conquer all of Persia and all of India and China. You get the sense from this novel that Gorvidal was really trying to say something about the complexity of human character and also the fact that it's, that complexity is okay and even that that complexity is perhaps desirable and that there is no such thing as good and evil. There are only complicated humans who have complicated lives and they themselves don't know who they are.